the grand miracle by professor cs lewis chapter 1 miracles i have known only one person in my life who claimed to have seen a ghost it was a woman and the interesting thing is that she disbelieved in the immortality of the soul before seeing the ghost and still disbelieves after having seen it she thinks it was a hallucination in other words seeing is not believing this is the first thing to get clear in talking about miracles whatever experiences we may have we shall not regard them as miraculous if we already hold a philosophy which excludes the supernatural any event which is claimed as a miracle is in the last resort an experience received from the senses and the senses are not infallible we can always say we have been the victims of an illusion if we disbelieve in the supernatural this is what we always shall say hence whether miracles have really ceased or not they would certainly appear to cease in western europe as materialism became the popular creed for uh, let us make no mistake if the end of the world appeared in all the literal trappings of the apocalypse if the modern materialist saw with his own eyes the heavens rolled up and the great white throne appearing if he had the sensation of being himself hurled into the lake of fire he would continue forever in that lake itself to regard his experience as an illusion and to find the explanation of it in psychoanalysis or cerebral pathology experience by itself proves nothing if a man doubts whether he is dreaming or waking no experiment can solve his doubt since every experiment may itself be part of the dream experience proves this or that or nothing according to the preconceptions we bring to it this fact that the interpretation of experiences depends on preconceptions is often used as an argument against miracles it is said that our ancestors taking the supernatural for granted and greedy of wonders read the miraculous into events that were really not miracles and in a sense i grant it that is to say i think that just as our preconceptions would prevent us from apprehending miracles if they really occurred so their preconceptions would lead them to imagine miracles even if they did not occur in the same way 
the doting man will think his wife faithful when she is not and the suspicious man will not think her faithful when she is the question of her actual fidelity remains meanwhile to be settled if at all on other grounds but there is one thing often said about our ancestors we must not say we must not say they believed in miracles because they did not know the laws of nature this is nonsense when saint joseph discovered that his bride was pregnant he was minded to put her away he knew enough biology for that he knew enough biology for that otherwise of course he would not have regarded pregnancy as a proof of infidelity when he accepted the christian explanation he regarded it as a miracle precisely because he knew enough of the laws of nature to know that this was a suspension of them when the disciples saw christ walking on the water they were frightened they would not have been frightened unless they had known the laws of nature and known that this was an exception if a man had no conception of a regular order in nature then of course he could not notice departures from that order just as a dunce who does not understand the normal meter of a poem is also unconscious of the poet's variations from it nothing is wonderful except the abnormal and nothing is abnormal until we have grasped the norm complete ignorance of the laws of nature would preclude the perception of the miraculous just as rigidly as complete disbelief in the supernatural precludes it perhaps even more so for while the materialist would have at least to explain miracles away the man wholly ignorant of nature would simply not notice them the experience of a miracle in fact requires two conditions first we must believe in a normal stability of nature which means we must recognize that the data offered by our senses recur in regular patterns secondly we must believe in some reality beyond nature when both beliefs are held and not till then we can approach with an open mind the various reports which claim that this super or extra natural reality has sometimes invaded and disturbed the sensuous content of space and time which makes our natural world the belief in such a supernatural reality itself can neither be proved nor disproved by experience the arguments for its existence are metaphysical and to me conclusive they turn on the fact that even to think and act in the natural world we have to assume something beyond it and even assume that we partly belong to that something in order to think we must claim for our own reasoning a validity which is not credible if our own thought is merely a function of our brain and our brains a by product of irrational physical processes in order to act above the level of mere impulse we must claim a similar validity for our judgments of good and evil in both cases we get the same disquieting result the concept of nature itself is one we have reached only tacitly 
by claiming a sort of supernatural status for ourselves. If we frankly accept this position and then turn to the evidence, we find of course that accounts of the supernatural meet us on every side. History is full of them, often in the same documents which we accept wherever they do not report miracles. Respectable missionaries report them not infrequently. The whole Church of Rome claims their continued occurrence. Intimate conversation elicits from almost every acquaintance at least one episode in his life which is what he would call queer or rum. No doubt most stories of miracles are unreliable but then as anyone can see by reading the papers so are most stories of all events. Each story must be taken on its merits. What one must not do is to rule out the supernatural as the one impossible explanation. Thus, you may disbelieve in the angels because you cannot find a sufficient number of sensible people who say they saw them. But if you found a sufficient number, it would, in my view, be unreasonable to explain this by collective hallucination. For Louis is referring to the story that angels appeared protecting British troops in their retreat from France on August 26, 1914. A recent summary of the event by Jill Kitson Did angels appear to British troops at Mons is found in History Makers No. 3, 1969, page 2 to 33. We know enough of psychology to know that spontaneous unanimity in hallucination is very improbable and we do not know enough of the supernatural to know that a manifestation of angels is equally improbable. The supernatural theory is the less improbable of the two. When the Old Testament says that Sanharib's invasion was stopped by angels and Herodotus says it was stopped by a lot of mice who came and ate up all the bowstrings of his army. An open-minded man will be on the side of the angels unless you start by begging the question. There is nothing intrinsically unlikely in the existence of angels or in the action ascribed to them. But mice just don't do these things. A great deal of skepticism now current about the miracles of our Lord does not, however, come from disbelief of all reality beyond nature. It comes from two ideas which are respectable but I think mistaken. In the first place, modern people have an almost aesthetic dislike of miracles. Admitting that God can, they doubt if he would. To violate the laws he himself has imposed on his creation seems to them arbitrary, clumsy, a theatrical device only fit to impress savages, a solecism against the grammar of the universe. In the second place, in the second place, many people confuse the laws of nature with the laws of thought and imagine that their reversal or suspension would be a contradiction in terms as if the resurrection of the dead were the same sort of thing as 2 and 2 making 5. I have only recently found the answer to the first objection. I found it first in George MacDonald and then later in Saint Athanasius. This is what Saint Athanasius says in his little book on the Incarnation. Our Lord took 
a body like travels and lived as a man in order that those who had refused to recognize him in his superintendence and captaincy of the whole universe might come to recognize from the works he did here below in the body that what dwelled in this body was the word of god this accords exactly with christ's own account of his miracles the son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the father do the doctrine as i understand it is something like this there is an activity of god displayed throughout creation a whole scale activity let us say which men refuse to recognize the miracles done by god incarnate living as a man in living as a man in palestine performed the very same things as this whole scale activity but at a different speed and on a smaller scale one of their chief purposes is that men having seen a thing done by personal power on the small scale may recognize when they see the same thing done on the large scale that the power behind it is also personal is indeed the very same person who lived among us 2000 years ago the miracles in fact are a retelling in small letters of the very same story which is written across the whole world in letters too large for some of us to see of that larger script part is already visible part is still unsolved in other words some of the miracles do locally what god has already done universally others do locally what he has not yet done but will do in that sense and from our human point of view some are reminders and others prophecies god creates the vine and teaches it to draw up water by its roots and with the aid of the sun to turn that water into a juice which will ferment and take on certain qualities thus every year from noah's time till ours god turns water into wine that men fail to see either like the pagans they refer the process to some finite spirit bacchus or dionysus or else like the moderns they attribute real and ultimate causality to the chemical and other material phenomena which are all that our senses can discover in it but when christ at cana makes water into wine the mask is off the miracle has only half its effect if it only convinces us that christ is god it will have its full effect if whenever we see a vineyard or drink a glass of wine we remember that here works he who sat at the wedding he who sat at the wedding party in cana every year god makes a little corn into much corn the seed is sown and there is an increase and men according to the fashion of their age say it is cereus it is adonis it is the corn king or else it is the loss of nature the close up the translation of this annual wonder is the feeding of the 5000 bread is not made there of nothing bread is not made of stones as the devil once suggested to our lord in vain a little bread is made into much bread the son will do nothing but what he says the father do there is so to speak a family style the miracles of healing fall into the same pattern this is sometimes obscured for us by the somewhat magical view we intend to take of ordinary medicine the doctors themselves do not take this view the magic is not in the medicine but in the patient's body what the doctor does is to stimulate nature's functions in the body and to remove hindrances in a sense though we speak for convenience of healing a cut every cut heals itself no dressing will make skin grow over a cut on a corpse that same mysterious energy which we call gravitational 
when it stares the planets and biochemical when it heals a body is the efficient cause of all recoveries and if god exists that energy directly or indirectly is his all who are cured are cured by him the healer within but once he did it visibly a man meeting a man but once he did it visibly a man meeting a man where he does not work within in this mode the organism dies hence christ's one miracle of destruction is also in harmony with god's whole scale activity his bodily hand held out in symbolic wrath blasted a single fig tree but no tree died that year in palestine or any year or in any land or even ever will save because he has done something or more likely ceased to do something to it when he fed the thousands he multiplied fish as well as bread look in every bay and almost every river this swarming pulsating fecundity shows he is still at work the ancients had a god called genius the god of animal and human fertility the presiding spirit of gynecology embryology and the marriage bed the genial bed and they called it after its god genius and the miracles of wine and bread and healing showed who bacchus really was who ferus who apollo and that all were one so this miraculous multiplication of fish reveals the real genius and with that we stand at the threshold of the miracle which for some reason most offends modern ears i can understand the man who denies the miraculous altogether but what is one to make of the people who admit some miracles but deny the virgin birth is it that for all their lip service to the laws of nature there is only one law of nature that they really believe or is it that they see in this miracle a slap upon sexual intercourse which is rapidly becoming the one thing venerated in a world without veneration no miracle is in fact for further information on this subject see the chapter on genius and genius in louis studies in medieval and renaissance literature walter hooper cambridge 1966 page 9 to 74 no miracle is in fact more significant what happens in ordinary generation what is a father's function in the act of begetting a microscopic particle of matter from his body fertilizes the female and with that microscopic particle passes it may be the color of his hair and his great grandfather's hanging lip and the human form in all its complexity of bones liver sinews heart and limbs and pre-human form which the embryo will recapitulate in the womb behind every spermatozoon lies the whole history of the universe look at with that it is no small part of the world's future that is god's normal way of making a man a process that takes centuries beginning with the creation of matter itself and narrowing to one second and one particle at the moment of begetting and once again men will mistake the sense impressions which this creative act throws off for the act itself or else refer it to some infinite being such as genius once therefore god does it directly instantaneously without a spermatozoon without the millenniums of organic history behind the spermatozoon there was of course another reason 
This time he was creating not simply a man but the man who was to be himself the only true man. The process which leads to the spermatozoon has carried down with it through the centuries must much undesirable silt. The process which leads to the spermatozoon has carried down with it through the centuries much undesirable silt. The life which reaches us by that normal route is tainted. To avoid that taint, to give humanity a fresh start, he once short-circuited the process. There is a vulgar anti-god paper which some anonymous donor sends me every week. In it, I recently saw the taunt that we Christians believe in a god who committed adultery with the wife of a Jewish carpenter. The answer to that is that if you describe the action of God in fertilizing Mary as adultery, then in that sense God would have committed adultery with every human who ever had a baby. For what he did once without a human father, he does always even when he uses a human father as his instrument. But the human father in ordinary generation is only a carrier, sometimes an unwilling carrier, always the last in a long line of carriers of life that comes from the supreme life. Thus, the filth that our poor, muddled, sincere, resentful enemies flinch at the Holy One either does not stick or sticking turns into glory. So much for the miracles which do small and quick what we have already seen in the large letters of God's universal activity. But before I go on to the second class, those which foreshadow parts of the universal activity we have not yet seen, I must guard against a misunderstanding. Do not imagine I am trying to make the miraculous miraculous. I am not arguing that they are more probable because they are less unlike natural events. I am trying to answer those who think them arbitrary, theoretical, theatrical, unworthy of God, meaningless interruptions of universal order. They remain in my view wholly miraculous. To do instantly with dead and baked corn what ordinarily happens slowly with life seed is just as great a miracle as to make bread of stones. Just as great but a different kind of miracle. That is the point. When I opened Ovid or Grimm, I find the sort of miracles which really would be arbitrary. Trees talk. Houses turn into trees. Magic rings raise. Tables richly spread with food in lonely places. Ships become goddesses and men are changed into snakes or birds or bears. It is fun to read about. The least suspicion that it had really happened would turn that fun into nightmare. You find no miracles of that kind in the Gospels. Such things, if they could be, would prove that some alien power was invading nature. They would not in the least prove that it was the same power which had made nature and rules her every day. But the true miracles express not simply a God, but God. That which is outside nature, not as a foreigner, but as her sovereign. They announce not merely that a king has visited our town, but that it is the king, our king. The second class of miracles on this view foretell what God has not yet done, but Will do universally. He raised one man, the man who was himself from the dead, because he will one day raise all men from the dead. Perhaps not only men, but there are hints in the New Testament that all creation will eventually be rescued from decay, restored to shape, and subserve the splendor of remade humanity. The transfiguration and the walking on the water are glimpses of the beauty and the effortless power over all matter which will belong to men when they are really waked by God. Now, resurrection certainly involves reversal of natural process in the sense that it involves a series of changes moving in the 
opposite direction to those we see. At death, matter which has been organic falls back gradually into the inorganic to be finally scattered and used perhaps in other organisms. Resurrection would be the reverse process. It would not, of course, mean the restoration to each personality of those very atoms, numerically the same, which had made its first or natural body. There would not be enough to go around for one thing and for another. The unity of the body, even in this life, was consistent with a slow but perplexed change of its actual ingredients. But it certainly does mean matter of some kind rushing toward organism as now we see it rushing away. It means, in fact, playing backwards a film we have already seen played forwards. In that sense, it is a reversal of nature, but of course it is a further question whether reversal in this sense is necessarily contradiction. Do we know that the film cannot be played backwards? Well, in one sense, it is precisely the teaching of modern physics that the film never works backwards. For modern physics, as you have heard before, the universe is running down. This organization and chance is continually increasing. There will come a time not infinitely remote when it will be wholly run down or wholly disorganized and finds no of no possible return from that state. There must have been a time not infinitely remote in the past when it was wound up, though science knows of no winding up process. The point is that for our ancestors the universe was a picture. For modern physics it's a story. If the universe is a picture, these things either appear in that picture or not, and if they don't, since it is an infinite picture, one may suspect that they are contrary to the nature of things, but a story is a different matter, especially if it is an incomplete story, and the story told by modern physics might be told briefly in the words, Humpty Dumpty was falling. That is, it proclaims itself an incomplete story. There must have been a time before he fell, when he was sitting on the wall. There must be a time after he had reached the ground. It is quite true that science knows of no horses and men who can put him together again once he has reached the ground and broken. But then she also knows of no means by which he could originally have been put on the wall. You wouldn't expect her to. All science rests on observation. All observations are taken during Humpty Dumpty's fall because we were born after he lost his seat on the wall and shall be extinct long before he reaches the ground. But to assume from observations taken while the clock is running down that the unimaginable winding up which must have preceded this process cannot occur when the process is over is the merest dogmatism from the very nature of the case of from the very nature of the case the laws of degradation and disorganization which we find in matter at present cannot be the ultimate and eternal nature of things if they were there would have been nothing to degrade and disorganize humpty dumpty can't fall off a wall that never existed obviously an event which lies outside the falling or disintegrating process which we know as nature is not imaginable. If anything is clear from the records of our Lord's appearances after his resurrection, it is that the risen body was very different from the body that died and that it lives under conditions quite unlike those of natural life. It is frequently not recognized by those who see it and it is not related to space in the same way as our bodies. The sudden appearances and disappearances suggest the ghost of popular tradition. Yet he emphatically insists that he is not merely a spirit and takes steps to demonstrate that the risen body can still perform animal operations such as eating. What makes all this baffling to us in our assumption that to pass beyond what we call nature, beyond the three dimensions and the five highly specialized and limited senses is immediately to be in a world of pure negative spirituality, a world where space of any sort or sense of or sense of any sort has no function. I know no grounds for believing this. 
To explain even an atom, Schrodinger wants seven dimensions and give us new senses and we should find a new nature. There may be natures piled upon natures, even supernatural, to the one beneath it. Before we come to the abyss of pure spirit and to be in that abyss at the right hand of the Father may not mean being absent from any of these natures may mean a yet more dynamic presence on all levels. That is why I think it very rash to assume that the story of the ascension is mere allegory. I know it sounds like the work of people who imagined an absolute up and down and a local heaven in the sky. But to say this is after all to say, assuming that the story is fake, we could thus explain how it arose without that assumption we find ourselves moving about in the world unrealized with no probability or improbability to guide us. For if the story is true, then a being still in some mode, though not our mode, corporeal, withdrew at his own will from the nature presented by our three dimensions and five senses, not necessarily into the nonsensuous and undimensioned and undimensioned but possibly into or through a world or worlds of super sense and super space and he might choose to do it gradually and he might choose to do it gradually. Who on earth knows what the spectators might see if they say they saw a momentary movement along the vertical plane then an indistinct mass then nothing. Who is to pronounce this improbable? My time is nearly up and I must be very brief with the second class of people whom I promised to deal with those who mistake the laws of nature for laws of thought and therefore think that any departure from them is a self-contradiction like a square circle or two and two making five. To think this is to imagine that the normal processes of nature are transparent to the intellectual that we can say why she behaves as she does. But of course, if we cannot see why a thing is so, then we cannot see any reason why it should not be otherwise. But in fact, the actual course of nature is wholly inexplicable. I don't mean that science has not yet explained it, but may do so someday. I mean that the very nature of explanation makes it impossible that we should even explain why matter has the properties it has. For explanation by its very nature deals with a world of ifs and ands. Every explanation takes the form since A therefore B and if C then D. In order to explain any event you have to assume the universe has a going concern. A machine working in a particular way. Since this particular way of working is the basis of all explanation, it can never be itself explained. We can see no reason why it should not have worked in a different way. To say this, to say this is not only to remove the suspicion that miracle is self-contradictory, but also to realize how deeply right Saint Athanasius was when he found an essential likeness between the miracles of our Lord and the general order of nature. Both are a full stop for the explaining intellect. If the natural means that which can be fitted into a class 
that which obeys a norm, that which can be parallel, that which can be explained by reference to other events, then nature herself as a whole is not natural. If a miracle means that which must simply be accepted, the unanswerable actuality which gives no account of itself but simply is, then the universe is one great miracle. To direct us to that great miracle is one main object of the earthly acts of Christ, that are, as he himself said, signs. They serve to remind us that the explanations of particular events which we derive from the given, the unexplained, the almost willful character of the actual universe are not explanations of that character. These signs do not take us away from reality. They recall us to it. They call us from our dream world of ifs and ends to the stunning actuality of everything that is real. They are focal points at which more reality becomes visible than we ordinarily see at once. I have spoken of how he made miracles, bread and wine, and of how when the virgin conceived, he had shown himself the true genius whom men had ignorantly worshipped long before. It goes deeper than that. Bread and wine were to have an even more sacred significance for Christians and the act of generations was to be the chosen symbol among the mystics for the union of the soul with God. These things are no accidents. With him there are no accidents. When he created the vegetable world, When he created the vegetable world, he knew already what dreams the annual death and resurrection of the corn would cause to stir in pious pagan minds. He knew already that he himself must so die and live again, and in what sense, including and far transcending the old religion of the corn king, he would say, this is my body common bread, miraculous bread, sacramental bread. These three are distinct but not to be separated. Divine reality is like a fugue. All his acts are different but they are but they all rhyme or echo to one another. All his acts are different, but they all rhyme or echo to one another. It is this that makes Christianity so difficult to talk, talk, talk about. It is this that makes Christianity so difficult to talk about. Fix your mind on any one story or any one doctrine and it becomes at once a magnet to which truth and glory come rushing from all levels of being. Our featureless pantheistic unities and glib rationalist distinctions are alike defeated by the seamless yet ever varying texture of reality, the lioness, the elusiveness, the intertwined harmonies of the multidimensional fertility of God. But if this is the difficulty, it is also one of the firm grounds of our belief to think that this was a fable, a product of our own brains, as they are a product of matter, would be to believe that this vast symphonic splendor had come out of something much smaller and emptier than itself. It is not so. We are nearer to the truth in the vision seen by Julian of Norwich when Christ appeared to her holding his hand a little thing like a hazelnut and saying, this is all that is created. And it seemed to her so small and weak that she wondered how it could hold together at all. <clears throat> The Grand Miracle by Professor C.S. Lewis, Chapter 2 Dogma and the Universe It 
is a common reproach against Christianity that its dogmas are unchanging while human knowledge is in continual growth. Hence, to unbelievers, we seem to be always engaged in the hopeless task of trying to force the new knowledge into molds which it has outgrown. I think this feeling alienates the outsider much more than any particular discrepancies between this or that doctrine and this or that scientific theory. We may, as we say, get over dozens of isolated difficulties, but that does not alter his sense that the endeavor as a whole is doomed to failure and perverse. Indeed, the more ingenious, the more perverse. For it seems to him clear that if our ancestors had known what we know about the universe, Christianity would never have existed at all. And however, we patch and mend no system of thought which claims to be immutable can, in the long run, adjust itself to our growing knowledge. That is the position I am going to try to answer. But before I go on to what I regard as the fundamental answer, I would like to clear up certain points about the actual relations between Christian doctrine and the scientific knowledge we already have. That is a different matter from the continual growth of knowledge we imagine whether reality or wrongly, whether rightly or wrongly, in the future and which as some think is bound to defeat us in the end. In one respect, as many Christians have noticed, contemporary science has recently come into line with Christian doctrine and parted company with the classical forms of materialism. If anything emerges clearly from modern physics, it is that nature is not everlasting. The universe had a beginning and will have an end. But the great materialistic systems of the past all believed in the eternity and tense in the self-existence of matter. As Professor Whitaker said in the Riddle Lectures of 1942, it was never possible to oppose seriously the dogma of the creation except by maintaining that the world has existed from all eternity in more or less its present state. <laughs> this fundamental ground for materialism has now been withdrawn. We should not lean too heavily upon this for scientific theories change. But at the moment it appears that the burden of proof rests not on us but on those who deny that nature has some cause beyond herself. In popular thought, however, the origin of the universe has counted, I think, for less than its character, its immense size and its apparent indifference, if not hostility to human life. And very often this impresses people all the more because it is supposed to be a modern discovery, an excellent example of those things which our ancestors did not know and which, if they had known them, would have prevented the very beginnings of Christianity. Here there is a simple historical falsehood. Ptolemy knew, just as well as Eddington, that the earth was infinitesimally in comparison with the whole content of space. Ptolemy knew, just as well as Eddington, that the earth was infinitesimal in comparison with the whole content of space. There is no question here of knowledge having grown until the frame of archaic thought is no longer able to contain it. The real question is why the spatial insignificance of the earth after being known for centuries should suddenly in the last century have become an argument against Christianity. I do not know why this has happened, but I am sure it does not mark an increased clarity of thought for the argument from size is, in my opinion, very feeble. When the doctor at a post-mortem diagnoses poison pointing to the state of the dead man's organs, his argument is rational because he has a clear idea of that opposite state in which the organs would have been found if no poison were present. In the same way, if we use the vastness of space and the smallness of earth to disprove the existence of God, we ought to have a clear idea of the sort of universe we should expect if God did exist. But have we? Whatever space may be in itself, and of course some moderns think it finite, we certainly perceive it as three-dimensional and to 
three-dimensional space we can conceive no boundaries by the very forms of our perceptions. Sir Edmund Taylor Whittaker, The Beginning and the End of the World, Riddle Memorial Lectures, 14th Series, Oxford, 1942. By the very forms of our perceptions, therefore, we must feel as if we lived somewhere in infinite space. If we discover no objects in this infinite space except those which are of use to man, our own sun and moon, then this vast emptiness would certainly be used as a strong argument against the existence of God. If we discover other bodies, they must be habitable or uninhabitable. And the odd thing is that both these hypotheses are used as grounds for rejecting Christianity. If the universe is teeming with life, this, we are told, reduces, reduces to absurdity. The Christian claim, or what is thought to be the Christian claim that man is unique, and the Christian doctrine that to this one planet God came down and was incarnate for us men and our salvation. If, on the other hand, the earth is really unique, then that proves that life is only an accidental byproduct in the universe and so again disproves our religion. Really, we are hard to please. We treat God as the police treat a man when he is arrested. Whatever he does will be used in evidence against him. I do not think this is due to our wickedness. I do not think this is due to our wickedness. I do not think that this is due to our wickedness. I suspect there is something in our very mode of thought which makes it inevitable that we should always be baffled by actual existence, whatever character actual existence may have. Perhaps a finite and contingent creature, a creature that might not have existed, will always find it hard to equate, equate in the brute fact that it is here and now attached to an actual order of things. However that may be, it is certain that the whole argument from size rests on the assumption that differences of size ought to coincide with the differences of value, but unless they do, there is of course no reason why the minute earth and the yet smaller human creatures upon it should not be the most important things in a universe that contains the spiral nebula. Now, is this assumption rational or emotional? I feel, as well as anyone else, the absurdity of supposing that the galaxy could be of less moment in God's eyes than such an atom as a human being. But I notice that I feel no similar absurdity in supposing that a man of five feet high may be more important than other man who is five feet three and a half, nor that a man may matter more than a tree or a brain more than a leg. In other words, the feeling of absurdity arises only if the differences of size are very great. But where a relation is perceived by reason, it holds good universally. But where a relation is perceived by reason, it holds good universally. If size and value had any real connection, small differences in size would accompany small differences in value as surely as large differences in size accompany large differences in value. But no, but no sane man could suppose that this is so. I don't think the taller man slightly more valuable than the shorter one. I don't allow a slight superiority to crease over men and then neglect it because it is too small to bother about. I perceive as long as I am dealing with the small differences of size that they have no connection with value whatsoever. 
I therefore conclude that the importance attached to the great differences of size is an affair, not of reason but of emotion, not of reason but of emotion, of that particular emotion which superiorities in size produce only after a certain point of absolute size has been reached. We are inveterate poets. Our imaginations awake. Instead of mere quantity, we now have a quality, the sublime. Unless this were so, the merely arithmetical greatness of the galaxy would be no more impressive than the figures in a telephone directory. It is thus, in a sense, from ourselves that the material universe derives its power to overawe us. To a mind which did not share our emotions and lacked our imaginative energies, the argument from size would be sheerly meaningless. Men look on the starry heavens with reverence. Monkeys do not. The silence of the eternal spaces terrified Pascal, but it was the greatness of Pascal that enabled them to do so. When we are frightened by the greatness of the universe, we are almost literally frightened by our own shadows. For these light years and billions of centuries are mere arithmetic until the shadow of man, the poet, the maker of myth, falls upon them. I do not say we are wrong to tremble at his shadow. It is the shadow of an image of God. But if ever the vastness of matter threatens our spirits. One must remember that it is matter spiritualized which does so. To puny man, the great nebula in Andromeda was in a sense its greatness. And this derives me to, and this drives me to say yet again that we are hard to please. If the world in which we found ourselves were not vast and strange enough to give us Pascal's terror, what poor creatures we should be, being what we are, rational but also animate, amphibians who start from the world of sense and proceed through myth and metaphor to the world of spirit, I do not see how we could have come to know the greatness of God without that hint furnished by the greatness of the material universe. Once again, what sort of universe do we demand? If it were small enough to be cozy, it would not be big enough to be sublime. If it is large enough for us to stretch our spiritual limbs in, it must be large enough to baffle us. cramped or terrified we must in any conceivable world be one or the other. I prefer terror. I should be suffocated in a universe that I could see to the end of. Have you never, when walking in a wood, turned back deliberately for fear you should come out at the other side and thus make it ever after in your imagination a mere beggarly strip of trees? I hope you do not think I am suggesting that God made the spiral nebulas solely or chiefly in order to give me the experience of awe and bewilderment. I have not the faintest idea why he made them. On the whole, I think it would be rather surprising if I had. As far as I understand the matter, Christianity is not wedded to an anthropocentric view of the universe as a whole. The first chapters of Genesis no doubt give the story of creation in the form of a folktale, a, fa a fact recognized as early as the time of Saint Jerome. And if you take them alone, you might get that impression. But if it is not conformed by the Bible as a whole, there are few places in literature where we are more sternly warned against making man the measure of all things than in the book of Job. Canst thou drought, Leviathan, 
with an hook? Will he make a covenant with thee? Will thou take him for a servant? Shall not one be cast down even at the sight of him?